Hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome. I'm Sarah DeLuca for SGS Live. I'm the Business Development Manager in North America for our Environment, Health, and Safety team at SGS. And today, we're going to explore contaminants of emerging concern and how they go from a chemical that's widely used in industry to being a health risk and monitored and regulated in the environment. We're also going to get a sneak peek into the future of emerging contaminants with some new updates on chlorinated paraffins. Before we get going, though, this is our first SGS live event on LinkedIn, and we're so excited to be streaming with you today. I know we're expecting some viewers and friends to be streaming us from New York, New Jersey, Texas, and California, but I also really want to know where in the world are you watching us from today? Please leave us a comment section, comment in the comment section, and I'll check in on that in just a second. Additionally, if you have any questions throughout this event, please feel free to use the comment section as we have a live support team who will be following up with you immediately and directly. So it seems like you can't go anywhere these days without seeing headlines in the news regarding contaminants in the environment. Attention grabbing stories like legislation tackles forever chemicals found in Indianapolis drinking water or Pennsylvania lawmakers push for 1.6 million in state budget for PFAS cancer study. The truth is that contaminants pose a threat to us and our environment on a daily basis. And as a company that's been working in the field of emerging contaminants and specialty testing business in North America for over 50 years, we have an incredible team of experts who contribute to the development and life cycle of a contaminant of emerging concern every day. Now, I'm about to welcome one of my colleagues to join me here today, but first I wanted to give a shout out to some of our viewers. It looks like we have, let's see, Asli in Turkey, hello. Vincent, I see, uh, Mahabu, hello. Oh, wow, I see Chile, India, Guatemala, Brazil. Oh my gosh, Colombia, Istanbul. We have friends from everywhere. I, thank you so much for joining us here today. We're so excited for you to be able to, uh, to join, in, uh, join in this event with us, hello. So today I'm talking to my colleague, Dr. Bharat Chandramoli, Environmental Laboratory Project Product Manager and Emerging Contaminant Portfolio Lead for SGS. Bharat, Hi, Sarah. Welcome. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? How are the kids doing? They're good. They're growing like weeds and everybody's healthy. So awesome. How about yours? Oh, he's good. He's out. So no, no, no interruptions today. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So, but uh, let's start at the very beginning with a, a well-known contaminant. Industry started using PFAS as far back as the 1940s in the form of waterproofing and nonstick coatings, and they grew in popularity through the 50s and 60s. What are PFAS and why are they so toxic? Oh, do you like chemistry? Um, goats, maybe? Because that's <laughs> where we're going to start today. So, awesome. Caprylic acid, uh, say it's a fatty acid with uh, eight carbon atoms. It's abundant in goat's milk and in humans too. And capra means goat, by the way. It only contains uh, carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens, and it's naturally occurring, of course. So take that same substance and replace all those hydrogens on that chain uh, with fluorine, and you get P4, uh, C8, this most famous of PFAS, or per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. So if, if you got that example, there are organic compounds where some of some or all the hydrogens have been replaced by fluorine. A family of about 5,000 or so or more chemicals containing fluorine, this fluorine is what makes that PFAS do incredible things. So they make your jackets both water and oil resistant at the same time, which is amazing. And you know that wine spill on the carpet that just beads up and so easy to just wipe off? That's PFAS too. So it's and then the fluorine, uh, you know, that that's that's what the fluorine does. But it's what also makes them an environmental challenge. That fluorine makes the PFAS very stable, and that resemblance to the thousands of organic uh, compounds that are in our body mean that they disrupt and change the way our body works. So with PFAS being so widely used at the time in everything from furniture to nonstick cookware, how did we how did we get to where we are today as we now have some legislation and regulation around the use and monitoring of these chemicals in the environment? PFAS, a great example of how a family of chemicals goes from ubiquitous use to becoming a regulated contaminant. It's a story rich in science, history, and people, and it's still unfolding right in front of our eyes right at this moment, right? It, that's what makes it so interesting. Uh, these chemicals start being widely used in polymer manufacturer, uh, waterproofing, and more since the 40s or so. I mean, uh, you know, fluoropolymers, Teflon, that kind of thing. 50 years later, research scientists start detecting it in the environment and in places as far as the Arctic. 
And that measurement in the environment in, in unexpected places, that's, that's the first step on that journey from chemical to contaminant. And, and there's initial discussion in the research community and an understanding that PFOS and P4 are persistent and can travel. That kind of knowledge uh, is what drives that initial concern. And then the involvement of national and international groups like the uh, Stockholm Convention. That, and that initial data then focuses attention on the manufacturers, users, and more. Meanwhile, there can be crystallizing events like the uh, death of livestock from contaminated wa water in uh, Parkersburg, West Virginia, that get the community scrambling to gather information on this uh, suddenly emerging chemical or environmental contaminant now. So, Bhadad, I know your R&D team is heavily engaged and involved with these international groups and plays a really interesting role in moving contaminants forward from showing up on a list of potentially concerning chemicals through to the next stage, including data collection. But can you share more insight with us on the unique role that SGS plays in this process? For sure. So our, our labs have been, especially our specialty labs, have been at the forefront of developing these robust measurement tools to help people understand the true breadth of occurrence of a contaminant of emerging concern. And this is this is one of the things we do best, help the environmental community understand the occurrence, fate, and transport of contaminants. And in this case, we were approached by governments and others trying to grapple with the PFAS problem. They didn't quite know how to get the data they needed. Uh, uh, there were some approaches out there, mainly academic, uh, but not widely accessible, uh, fairly challenging. and. We, we are also the challenge. We developed some of the most first commercially available and scalable PFAS measurement methods that really helped uh, kickstart nationwide PFAS studies, um, Minnesota, for example. Once researchers start getting more and more of this data, then we start realizing that PFAS is not just local contamination or you know around or some kind of discharge event. It is worldwide. We start measuring high levels near airports. So they find that the firefighting foam used for decades has high levels of PFOS. Um, we find it in the fish people eat, in the water people drink. And, and at the same time, scientists are starting to look at toxicity as well. And then we're seeing health effects at relatively low levels. So things like liver damage, uh, immune system disruption, and reduced vaccine efficacies. And you know, uh, vaccines are on everyone's mind right now. So that's, that's an especially touchy one. Yeah, no kidding, very topical. So speaking of the food chain and drinking water, a moment ago you mentioned events like Parkersburg, West Virginia. How do events like this affect the trajectory of an emerging contaminant like PFOS? And with that, both a question for you and for our viewers, have you seen the movie Dark Waters? It's a 2019 film, a true story about PFOS contamination in Parkersburg. To our viewers today, use the comment section. Let us know if you like this movie as much as I did. But Ad, what did you think of the movie? And again, how do events like this affect your trajectory of an emerging contaminant? Yeah, I mean, I love the movie. I mean, it's a, it's a movie about environmental chemistry and the people affected. I, I felt so represented with watching and then walking out of the theater there. Uh, <laughs> and, events like, and events like Parkersburg really humanize the complex problems of environmental chemistry and toxicology. It, it becomes about people and their health, and it's not just about unpronounceable chemical names. And we had a part in that C8 project that didn't quite make the movie, but I'm going to tell you about it. Uh, the people of Parkersburg reached a settlement, as you know from the movie, to have their blood monitored for PFAS. And one of our labs was uh, actually selected as the quality control lab to ensure that this critical information on PFAS levels that the uh, main lab was generating in people was accurate. And then, uh, you know, once the researchers start looking at the first four months of data, they realize that there's a difference between the results from these uh, from the main lab and our our data, which is the quality control data, which which we're which we're doing to ensure that everything is going okay. Um, the researchers kind of take take a little closer look at this and then realize that uh, there was a small uh, process issue in the main lab that led to this inaccuracy. And then, you know. Luckily, it was caught early and the issue is fixed and, you know, the rest is history. The tests are run again. Uh, results match up really well. And it's it's one of those things. We're so happy to have played our part in ensuring the health and safety of people of Parkersburg. And it's those kinds of projects that really keep us going. Isn't that isn't that so true? And, and wow, so interesting. Um, I'm just gonna, I'm checking in with our viewers, and I don't see as many people. I was thinking that we're gonna have seen this movie, so I, I go out and see Dark Waters if you haven't already. Um, just a, a true story about environmental contaminants and PFAS in particular um, in this town in Parkersburg. Um, definitely recommend it. So. 
But uh, after this initial community data collection, where is the industry at with respect to the evolution of PFAS monitoring? It's been 25 or so years, right, since PFAS entered our radar as, as an emerging concern. We're now well on our path from regulation to restriction. So the use of the more persistent and problematic PFAS and PFOA are restricted and on phase out, and there's increasing scrutiny on other PFAS. So US states in multiple countries regulate levels of PFAS in the environment, and there is a lot of work being done on the remediation of contaminated sites and an understanding in even great, greater detail, you know, the effects on people and ecosystems. So uh, uh, ironically, PFAS has released this amazing um, uh, innovation in the in the whole remediation industry. It's quite, it's been amazing to watch. The US EPA is likely to add PFAS and PFOA to the maximum contaminants level in drinking water list very soon, essentially bringing PF, PF, uh, at least these two PFAS from that contaminant of emerging concern to a regulated contaminant. And many countries in the world are essentially on this path uh, to regulation. Okay, so with more and more regulation updates, um, what is SGS currently working on with respect to the continued development of PFAS? Yeah, we, uh, we continue to support the environmental community with what has now become a routine PFAS analysis. And that's, we're generating and everyone else is generating a lot of da data daily, which is such a change from 10, 15 years back. But one of the initiatives we're especially proud of is our role in the official PFAS measurement method for the US EPA. So we have over the years developed, I think nine or so methods for the EPA and the PFAS method continues this progression. Uh, currently, the EPA only has methods in drinking water for PFAS, and there's a great need for standardization in every other uh, compartment. Uh, EPA methods are vitally important in regulation as they provide the consensus definitive approaches that everyone can use and refer to. So I mean, reduce some of the questions on data and you know, so that everyone can focus on what it actually means. So we're working with the EPA to ensure that going forward, uh, people needing data on um, PFAS and wastewater, fish, soil, sediment, and more can refer to a standard EPA method. It's been an involved and challenging projects and one that our scientists, especially uh, Dr. Corinne Hamilton, who's leading the project, has been really happy to uh, sink their teeth into. That's awesome and, and so unique for like a high volume commercial laboratory to be so engaged on the R&D side of method development and just that level of support for the US EPA. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Exciting news to share with the environmental community. So in the life cycle of an emerging contaminant of concern, the first step is to become aware of the contaminant and from there kind of studying its existence and effects on the surrounding environments and ecosystems before coming up with ways to measure and quantify it so that we can address it. So let's shake things up for a second and talk about other contaminants. In the scientific community, we've been aware of dioxins and PCB since the 1970s when they were considered emerging contaminants. Can you give me an example of the evolution of our management of dioxins and PCBs? For sure, the, the, the PFAS cycle, I think we discussed this, is, rep, is in some ways representative of that evolution of concern and management of so many other contaminants. We've been here before. So you have a chemical like a PCB, urobrominated flame retardant, or a chlorinated pesticide. It's used in many years in multiple applications. But it becomes an environmental concern in many ways when researchers start finding it in the environment, in animals and in people. And then there's a lot of research that needs to be done to fill in the gaps and understand those three big questions. Uh, is it persistent? It, does it stay around in the environment for a long time? Um, is it bioaccumulated? Meaning, does it move as, does it, you know, does the concentration get bigger as it goes up the food web? Um, is it toxic at environmentally relevant levels? Over the last 50 years, our specialty labs have been looking at environmental contaminants. We've been you know, privileged to be there with the environmental community as we collectively grapple with these questions, especially on the PCBs and the dioxins and the chlorinated pesticides. And in that role, uh, we've been one of the first, if not the first commercial labs to develop definitive methods for measuring occurrence, fate and transport. So we've been involved in many, many dioxins and PCB projects over the years. That's awesome. So kind of speaking of chemical transport, the food chain is an important method to accumulate toxins in our body. And one unique capability that SGS has is the ability to test for emerging contaminants, not only in you know groundwater, surface water, drinking water, soil and air, but also human biomonitoring samples and fish tissue. Can you tell me about your work with dioxin and PCBs in the food chain? For sure. 
I mean, Sarah, as you know, I live in the Pacific Northwest, right? And we take our salmon very seriously. Um, crucial to our ecosystem, vital part of our traditional First Nations and modern diets. Um, many of the persistent organic pollutants concentrate and bioaccumulates in, in the fat of lipids and fats or lipids of animals. So, and that's especially true for PCBs, dioxins, and chlorinated pesticides. Oh, so that's not what I want to be thinking about when I'm digging into my sushi. No, you want to be <laughs> thinking about what it tastes like or what the seasoning was, right? So, yeah. But, <laughs> Salmon are fatty carnivores. So, and as people ate more and more salmon, especially uh, farm salmon, um, scientists start getting worried about contaminants people are being exposed to. Our, uh, our labs specialize in these types of contaminants. And back in the late 90s, we had worked with the EPA on a very sensitive method to measure every PCB congener. So we're well used to this kind of challenge. And when a group of researchers approached us to help understand contaminant levels in salmon, we were only too happy to participate. So uh, we measured uh, levels of dioxins, PCBs, and pesticides in over 700 uh, farmed and wild salmon from all over the world. You know, we got samples from Europe, North and South America, and then we also looked at the fish feed that uh, the farm salmon were eating too. Wow, um, that's super interesting. Are you able to share with us what the research found? For sure. Um, overall, they found that uh, contaminant levels in farm salmon were quite a bit higher than in wild salmon in this particular study. And that was across the board. Uh, and there were significant geographical differences as well. European farm salmon were much higher than American farm salmon. And it, it all came from the diet. It's that dictum, you are what you eat, right? It applies to, applies to everyone, apparently. Uh, farm salmon ate concentrated feed high in fish oils and fish meal. And because that feed was made from fish in relatively polluted waters, they were high in organic uh, contaminants. And so because of the bioaccumulated nature, the salmon were correspondingly high as well. And concerningly, the uh, researchers found that in some cases, eating these fish even a few times a month could potentially cause more harm from the pollutants and outweigh the benefits of eating the salmon, like you know, from the omega-3 fatty acids and other benefits. Wow, so uh, farm salmon is worse for me than a wild salmon? That's alarming. Is that is that where we're at today? No, 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 not at all. Uh, that kind of valuable information that scientists generate and we help um, routinely informs policy and change. With salmon, especially this study and other studies and contamination events led to much regulation, especially in Europe, but across the world as well. The the Stringent regulations were imposed on dioxins, PCBs, and more in fish feed, and they continue today. That increased attention in testing was responsible for significantly lowering the contaminant levels in the feed and then in the salmon as well. So in many ways, I mean, this is a success story of how good data and good research uh, inform regulation and improve the health of many. And again, as I said, that that's that's why we love the work we do. It's that it's that impact on the environment, on people's health, and it's 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 interesting. I, I totally agree with you, and I love that our teams are so passionate about the work we do, knowing that it leads to the protection of human health and the environment. In looking at the results of the salmon project, I know that PCBs were created to serve a purpose. However, not all contaminants are chemicals that were intentionally made by industry, right? Some exist as, by accident or as byproducts. For sure. Uh, Dioxins are a very good example of a persistent pollutant that are byproducts of manufacture of uh, other chemicals So, or from burning chlorinated waste. So when you make a, a pesticide and herbicide, you might make a dioxin. Uh, or when you burn chlorinated waste, that could happen too. They're very toxic and persistent and have been associated with some of the biggest environmental issues of our time. The most uh, toxic dioxin, 2378-TCDD, uh, was an impurity in Agent Orange. This, and this was an herbicide used extensively in Vietnam during the war. Uh, this led to the water and land there and fish uh, becoming heavily polluted. And after the war ended, the people there were grappling with this uh, toxic legacy. And, and, uh, and discussion around cleanup started right away. The military bases where the uh, Agent Orange was stored were especially highly contaminated and polluting the land and water nearby. Oh, wow, that's terrible. Do you have any insight on what's happened since then to address that contamination? Lots has happened. The US and Vietnam government are uh, collaborating to clean up some of the contamination. 
Um, and this is one of the projects near and dear to our heart was our some of our early work uh, supporting this initiative. Using our very uh, sensitive dioxin analyses in human blood, we monitored people around the contaminated sites uh, before and during the remediation. Uh, we also measured dioxins in soil and in the fish that the people depended on for their food. Uh, massive remediation undertaking expected to continue through 2030. So, you know, it's been going on for a while, going to continue. And very interesting technology being used as well. But for us, the, the, it, you know, there, were, there was even more uh, things going on. The government of Vietnam really wanted us to, uh, wanted to build up local expertise in dioxin analysis because you know, this is something that you don't want to be sending samples far, far away if you can help it. And so we had scientists from Vietnam over to our labs training with our experienced scientists, uh, talk, taking this knowledge back home to set up their labs. And we've also helped gone over there uh, to train and help maintain these high quality standards to do dioxin analysis. Dioxin's uh, very challenging to measure. Uh, that local expertise is critical to the ongoing success of long-term projects like this. And so it's been a privilege for our lab to be involved in this kind of training and knowledge transfer as well. That's tremendous. I personally think it's so special that our, our global team of chemists and subject matter experts are so not only open, but excited to share our technical knowledge of analytical chemistry across governmenting agencies and partners and the industry in general with that passion for bettering the state of science, the environment and human health. So, but I, I know that there has been some talk about another contaminant of emerging concern, chlorinated paraffins. And it's not that chlorinated paraffins are new, but there's been some challenges at finding ways to measure this contaminant, which makes it very difficult to get it to that next stage in the emerging contaminant life cycle. So, and to put it into a little bit of context, the, the production volume of chlorinated paraffins over time is almost 8 million tons. That dwarfs the total amount of PCBs manufactured at 1.3 million tons. So that definitely means there's a certain amount of urgency in identifying them and moving forward. Can you bring us up to speed with what's happening happening right now with chlorinated paraffins? Yeah, um, it just it's been it's it's one of those again that same pattern, right? Uh, chlorinated paraffins, high production industrial chemical, manufactured for nearly a century, used in many different applications: rubber additives, leather lubricants, um, waterproofing, fire retardants. You know, so many things. The fact that you mentioned on that cumulative production, so interesting. I did not know this before I started <laughs> looking into it. Um, and in our conversation today, uh, you've probably noticed this common thread here um, that weaves through all of these contaminants we've discussed. They're highly halogenated. That is, they contain many fluorines, chlorines, or bromines. And that's what gives these substances their unique properties, whether it's waterproofing, um, firefighting, whatever it might be. But it's, it's also what continues to make these kinds of uh, chemicals up uh, environmental challenges. So I would assume then that we would expect chlorinated paraffins to present kind of the same sort of challenges. Exactly. Uh, researchers have identified some of these as persistent bioaccumulative and toxic. And one set, the uh, short chain chlorinated paraffins have been added to the Stockholm Convention and are subject to production bans with some exceptions. But uh, we've been quite a bit far behind in our understanding of our, their prevalence in our ecosystems because they are they are difficult to measure. Uh, unlike discrete chemicals like PFOS or PFOA, they are complex mixtures of related chemical structures. And complex mixtures are the most challenging of measurement puzzles because you're not looking at one or two things, you're looking at thousands of things and how to measure and prioritize it it just keeps many people up at night. Um, there are approach of, approaches available, but they've been complex. They've either been very complex, requiring um, you know difficult and expensive instrumentation, or uh, you know imperfect and subject to error. So we've been looking for years for this kind of this missing middle, this kind of a, a breakthrough approach to unlock this measurement puzzle. I think we're finally there. Wow, that's awesome. Congrats to the entire team on the exceptional groundbreaking work done here. Can you tell me more? Yeah, uh, one of our most uh, experienced scientists, Dr. Million Woodner, built on this approach from previous uh, work uh, to develop a method for measuring chlorinated paraffins. It's fairly unique. It produces the type of data scientists need, which is measuring the chlorinated paraffins by carbon chain length and level of chlorination. 
It avoids many of the errors and interferences of previous methods as well. And very importantly, it abuses instrumentation that is widely commercialized and easily available to many labs. So we're, we're really excited about this. And so are many of the scientists who will be using this data we generate to understand how widely prevalent, uh, prevalent these chlorinated paraffins are in North America and what the scope of the problem is. They've been around for a long time and you know they're almost a forgotten pop. There's been a little bit of data generated uh, by many people, but we really want uh, this to, uh, to grow. And so we'll see over the next uh, few years how this story unfolds. We don't know the answers. We don't know the end, uh, but that's what keeps us going, that knowledge that uh, you know, there's that we can help people and we can, you know, we can generate this important data. That's an outstanding achievement. Congratulations to the entire team involved. I love sharing scientific breakthroughs with the environmental community about innovations and achievement in our work. That's fantastic. To our viewers, help me say congrats to the R&D team uh, for this breakthrough on the new method development for chlorinated paraffins by shooting them a message in the comment section. I'm sure that chlorinated paraffins won't be the last contaminant that SGS will continue to evolve in its journey along the contaminant of emerging concern life cycle. Uh, but are there others that you're currently working on? Constantly, we have a long li wish list and not enough time. Um, you know, starting with PFAS, we as a community know how to measure 60 or 80 PFAS now routinely. There are over 5,000 PFAS. So that's gonna keep us busy for a long time. Um, but uh, but that's not just what we're working on. Uh, we continue to work on expanding our uh, pharmaceuticals and personal care products methods uh, to look for what else is going out in the environment in our wastewater, uh, you know, uh, flame retardants, uh, you name it. We're, we're just keeping very busy. And so, you know, it's uh, I can go on and on for many hours about everything else we're doing, but uh, just suffice to say, you know, not not enough time. <laughs> Fair. That's awesome. So for our viewers today, if you want to learn more about any emerging contaminants or if you'd like um, if you'd like to hear about other environmental contaminants on our next live event, please feel free to send us a note in the comment section. But I, as always, it's been an absolute pleasure to connect with you today. Thank you so much for sharing. Oh, my pleasure too, Sarah. It's been fun. Hope to see you in real life sometime soon when, you know, when we can all travel and all that. So yeah, it's been a while. Agreed. Totally. So it's been a tremendous amount of information that we've covered here today. If you wish to learn more, please feel free to comment below. And of course, please feel free to visit us at SGS.com. Thanks again for joining me. I'm Sarah DeLuca for SGS Live. Bye for now. Bye, everyone. Bye.